Something big just shook up the space world, and almost no one saw it coming. U.S. President Donald Trump just signed a new executive order that could completely change how SpaceX's Starship gets to the moon. On paper, it sounds like a massive win. But behind the scenes, NASA scientists and SpaceX insiders are warning this could spark the biggest space race controversy in years. So what's really going on with Trump's moon plan, and why is SpaceX suddenly at the center of it? Find out everything in today's Tech Map episode. What on earth is going on with Trump's new executive order? Recently, Donald Trump signed an order about his space policy confirming his goal to send Americans back to the moon by 2028. However, what's worth noting is that Artemis has always been NASA's main focus. So this new order isn't really a fresh idea. So why repeat it now? Well, what got everyone's attention isn't the moon plan itself. It's the fact that it came through an executive order. Think of an executive order as a kind of presidential memo. It tells government agencies like NASA what to prioritize. But here's the twist. These orders don't have the power of law. A new president can simply cancel or change them. For example, Biden adjusted Trump's 2017 moon directive after taking office. So while this new order is official right now, it could vanish the moment another administration steps in. If NASA misses the 2028 target, nothing legally happens. The order just tells them to make a 90-day plan explaining how they'll reach the moon with the budget they already have. But presidents can't magically create funding or technology breakthroughs. Past executive orders have faced similar problems, ambitious timelines blocked by money shortages and rocket issues. In other words, these orders sound bold, but depend entirely on Congress for real funding. That's why some people mock them as presidential wish lists, grand visions drawn in crayon without the budget to back them up. But here's where it gets more serious. This new order directly clashes with Trump's skinny budget proposal for NASA from May 2nd. That plan cuts NASA's funding by 24% to about $18.8 billion for fiscal year 2026 and aims to shrink staff by nearly one third through retirements and buyouts. In short, Trump's administration wants NASA to move faster with less money and fewer people. Inside the agency, the reaction has been harsh. Nearly 300 current and former employees signed a letter calling these cuts so brutal that astronauts could die and criticizing the rapid and wasteful changes. And that risk would further exacerbate the feasibility of the 2028 timeline, especially when critical systems are not yet ready. Take the Orion spacecraft, for example. After 19 years of development and around $24 billion spent $31 billion if you adjust for inflation, it's only now nearing completion. The version flown on Artemis 1 didn't even have a working life support system yet. Critics argue that planning to send astronauts on Artemis 2 without fully testing those systems is reckless, especially since once the spacecraft leaves Earth orbit, there's no easy way to turn back if something fails. Even though the Orion has a NASA docking system tested on the ground, it still hasn't proven itself in space. That crucial test won't come until Artemis 3. The pressure to stay on schedule might push NASA into taking risks. It normally wouldn't. That's already happened before. During Artemis 1, one of Orion's eight power and data units was known to have a fault. But instead of replacing it, which would have delayed the mission for about a year, NASA decided to fly with it anyway. The same kind of shortcut showed up with Orion's heat shield. After Artemis 1, one engineers found that parts of the shield were chipping and cracking during re-entry. Instead of redesigning it completely, NASA just tweaked the material formula and adjusted the re-entry path to reduce peak heat. They declared it ready for Artemis 2, even though the original problem wasn't fully fixed. Here's what happened in detail during Artemis 1's re-entry gases built up under the Avcoat heat shield layer because the heating rate was slower than expected in the skip re-entry profile. That trapped gas caused chunks of the material, some the size of golf balls, to break off. Ground tests had missed this because they used higher heat levels. NASA insists the shield still did its job, but critics warn that the incomplete repair could shift stress to other areas possibly creating new risks next time. 
It's a classic case of what safety experts call normalization of deviance. That means small rule-bending decisions start to feel normal over time until something goes wrong. NASA has seen this pattern before. In its biggest accidents, from Apollo to the Space Shuttle program, warnings were often downplayed with a simple, it'll be fine. The problem wasn't a lack of technical knowledge. It was failing to stick to strict safety and inspection standards when under pressure. The same mindset appears to be creeping back. Last year's Starliner issue showed similar warning signs. According to a NASA safety panel, both Boeing and NASA switched from approve its safe approach to approve its unsafe one. That's a major shift. Normally, NASA assumes every spacecraft is dangerous until testing proves it's reliable. You have to show that every system from heat shields to docking ports works in the worst possible conditions. But now NASA seems to be accepting flights unless someone can prove they're deadly. That's a dangerous reversal. Saying it hasn't failed yet isn't the same as saying it's safe. In fact, during tests before flight, both NASA and Boeing admitted they didn't fully understand why some thrusters failed or whether they would work on the next mission. So when missions go ahead anyway, it starts to look less like confidence and more like wishful thinking hoping nothing goes wrong instead of knowing it won't. The lack of seriousness showed up again in how NASA handled the situation after the Starliner incident. When the spacecraft ran into problems during its approach to the ISS, NASA should have immediately issued an official statement calling it a mishap, or at least a high-visibility close call. That kind of transparency is standard after any serious problem. But instead, NASA delayed its response and released vague statements that left everyone guessing what had really happened. If there was any doubt that Starliner could safely bring the crew back to Earth, that should have been treated as an emergency. Declaring early that the spacecraft was unsafe for return would have allowed both NASA and its partners to plan an alternative rescue quickly and safely. Instead, the crew ended up staying on the ISS for about nine months, far longer than the one or two weeks originally planned. It gave the impression that NASA just couldn't bring itself to put safety first. This attitude partly came from NASA's overconfidence in Boeing. NASA assumed Boeing would bring the same level of safety discipline and design precision that it had shown decades earlier in aviation. But Boeing underestimated how complex human spaceflight really is and how much rigorous testing it requires. That overconfidence led to weak oversight. NASA trusted Boeing's process too much, so critical problems only came to light after the incident. Boeing tried to mirror NASA's engineering approach but NASA didn't verify if they were actually following it correctly. When investigators finally took a closer look, they found Boeing had no solid system engineering management plan. In practice, it meant engineers across the company were each using their own methods, creating a scattered and inconsistent design process. Even worse, this should have been easy to catch. Boeing's documentation was so incomplete that anyone reviewing it carefully would have seen the gaps immediately. But according to sources, NASA personnel simply approved the documents without fully reading them. The result was a broken review system where both sides assumed the other was doing the necessary checks until it was too late. In contrast to Boeing's struggle, NASA made things a lot tougher for SpaceX during Crew Dragon's development, and that turned out to be a good thing. NASA demanded strict safety standards, detailed documentation, and constant verification, forcing SpaceX to meet the highest levels of design rigor. Instead of slowing them down, that pressure helped SpaceX refine its process and become more efficient. SpaceX used what it called an iterative waterfall approach. NASA traditionally followed the classic waterfall model design everything on paper. First document every step and only then start building and testing. It's slow and methodical, but very safe. SpaceX combined that discipline with its own fast-paced, hands-on style build, test, fail, fix, repeat. The result was a hybrid method structured enough to satisfy NASA's requirements, but flexible enough to learn from real-world testing quickly. This approach saved both time and money. 
While NASA and Boeing were bogged down in paperwork for Starliner, SpaceX was already flying Crew Dragon successfully. SpaceX also pushed toward a more agile system, small teams making quick decisions, testing constantly, and cutting out unnecessary documents. Instead of spending months proving something on paper, they proved it through data. For example, Crew Dragon went through hundreds of real docking and re-entry tests before flying astronauts. SpaceX argued that too much paperwork can actually hide risks by delaying real testing, and NASA eventually saw that the data-backed approach worked. Crew Dragon reached the ISS safely before Starliner ever did. That same philosophy is now driving Starship's human landing system development for Artemis. SpaceX uses real launches from Starbase testing early prototypes, identifying failures and improving with each flight. Even though the system isn't perfect yet, it's already met dozens of NASA milestones in areas like life support docking and power systems. Instead of waiting for every document to be perfect, SpaceX learns by flying. What really sets SpaceX apart, though, is its consistency. From the start, the company has focused on one big goal, Mars. Every project, even those done under NASA contracts, supports that long-term vision. For example, the technology they're building for Artemis, like in-orbit refueling, and the ability to relight engines in space also happens to be exactly what they'll need for future Mars missions. Therefore, if SpaceX succeeds in helping NASA land on the moon by 2028, they could send the first people to Mars around the same time. Meanwhile, NASA's own programs have suffered from the opposite problem, a lack of consistency. Since the George W. Bush era, every administration has changed space priorities, leading to cancelled missions, shifting goals, and wasted years. Without a stable direction, progress has constantly reset instead of building forward.